brief are in listen only mode. Hello, welcome to PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Morose, and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today, Jeff Keith, Coordinator of the Saskatchewan Conservation Data Centre, will be talking about why data sharing. Every month, PCAP has someone to present either in the form of a webinar or an in-person talk in a Saskatchewan community on anything to do with native prairie conservation or species at risk. Stay tuned for our upcoming Native Prairie Speaker Series webinars. Ellie Knight, PhD candidate from the University of Alberta, will be talking about nighthawks and nightjars on Tuesday, January 23rd at noon. Details will be posted for this webinar on the PCAP website in the near future. Check out that website for information about the upcoming Native Prairie Restoration Reclamation Workshop that will be taking place February 7th to 8th, 2018 in Saskatoon. I would like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by Environment and Climate Change Canada, Eco-Friendly Saskatchewan, Ranchers Stewardship Alliance, Inc., and SASTAL. In-kind support for today's webinar has been given by the Saskatchewan Conservation Data Centre. A reminder to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard at any time during the presentation. Questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. Now, a bit about our presenter. Jeff Keith is the coordinator for the Saskatchewan Conservation Data Centre. He started with the SKCDC in 1992 as the data manager. He spent some time as the zoologist and then became the coordinator. Jeff works with a highly skilled team of biologists that leads Saskatchewan's Ministry of Environment on Species at Risk Inventory and Status Assessment work. Jeff completed his Bachelor's of Science in Wildlife Biology at the University of Guelph and after successfully avoiding technology for most of his undergraduate work, decided to learn how to apply geographic information systems to biological problems. He completed his Master's of Science at the University of Regina in Geography, looking at home range and terrain selection of Yukon moose. Jeff grew up spending summers on Georgian Bay, canoeing, camping, and developed a strong sense or strong interest in wildlife. He spent time working for fisheries and oceans as a student on big lakes in northern Ontario, so it made sense he would end up where things don't block your view. So, Jeff, if you're ready to begin, I will pass the control over to you. Here we go. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, everything's working, I hope. Yes, we can see um, your screen perfectly. Excellent. Okay, um, well, thanks again, Caitlin, for the introduction, and thanks to uh, PCAP for the opportunity to uh, talk to folks about data sharing and the value of uh, doing so. Um, as Caitlin mentioned, I'm the coordinator for the Saskatchewan Conservation Data Center, and I've spent the last 25 years being part of an effort to collect, assess, manage, and share information on Saskatchewan's biodiversity. Data sharing is something I think is important, and I hope I can make it more entertaining for you than watching paint dry. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the Conservation Data Center partners for their ongoing support. Uh, they include Nature Saskatchewan, the Nature Conservancy of Canada, the Native Plant Society of Saskatchewan, and the Saskatchewan uh, Invasive Species Council. So I'd like to talk a little bit about why, why you would share data. Um, in this case, we're really sort of talking about wildlife observations, but I'd be happy to talk with folks offline about other aspects of natural history information sharing. Um, some of you will probably be familiar with some of the data sharing websites that I'd like to introduce, uh, but some of you may not be aware of them, and uh, there's some really interesting ways to, to share information from old-fashioned email to 
some pretty real, some pretty interesting websites. Um, I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about what we at the Conservation Data Center do with all of the observations that are submitted. Um, if you choose to share them with us, and I hope uh, there'll be a little bit of time at the end for questions. Uh, but I'd be happy to answer questions over the phone or by email if if we run out of time. So why share data? In my mind, uh, the reasons break down into personal and social or community-based reasons. Um, on the personal side, I won't go into the, the psychology of sharing. Suffice to say, when we do share information or other things, um, there's solid evidence uh, in the literature that doing so makes us feel better. I guess that's the, the misery halved, joy doubled kind of thing. Uh, some folks are into uh, a, a more competitive kind of approach. Um, first to see something, those kinds of things. Uh, um, in talking with uh, colleagues at the Texas Natural Heritage Program, which is the CDC equivalent in Texas, they talked about uh, their Herptile Century Club, where unpaid naturalist observers basically race to observe 100 reptiles in 100 counties in the state. Um, you know, and it's, it's sort of the gamification of natural history observation. And, and uh, I mean, we have that sort of thing in Saskatchewan too, where, where folks are really keen on seeing those trophy deer and things like that, that uh, really get them moving in the, in the day. Um, sharing wildlife observations, particularly online, creates a lasting record of your efforts. Um, names like Wayne Harris, Bob Kreba still come up in our data queries. Um, even though they're no longer with us, their information is still providing um, an understanding of biodiversity's abundance and distribution in the province. Um, Bernie DeVries, Bernard DeVries is uh, retired from field work now, but is still our authoritative source on lichen distribution in Saskatchewan just because he has a passion for it. These folks have all made a lasting contribution to our understanding of the distribution of wild species in Saskatchewan. On the community or social side, um, Sorry, folks. Sharing information gives you the chance to make a contribution to the conservation of species that you care about. Um, folks are interested in, in deer. We have the, the Cooperative Deer Management Survey. It's actually the Cooperative Wildlife Management Survey now because it includes moose and elk and other things. Um, and there's a, an app, smartphone app, that has come out this year for that. Um, for other species, I'll get into some of the opportunities and tools in a moment. Um, it also gives you the opportunity to share your piece of the puzzle with others. Um, some folks may be passionate about slime molds or true bugs, and you're interested in big game or birds or whatever. Everybody contributes their piece, and it, it helps to build the puzzle. So where and how can I share my data? The first um, data sharing website that I want to introduce to folks, if they're not aware of it, um, is the iNaturalist website. This website was originated in the United States, but it has chapters or local storefronts scattered across the planet. Um, the Canadian page, iNaturalist.ca, um, is, is part of that network of uh, 
um, portals to to this kind of website. Um, the interesting thing about this approach is that it's a Canadian portal, but you're sharing this information with with the world, and the world is able to um, contribute to the identification or the confirmation of species um, through crowdsourcing kind of approach. Um, answers are very quickly provided. I've had photos identified in, in a matter of days or even hours. And once the, the photos have uh, been confirmed by a, a number of folks, it becomes research grade and is um, wide, more widely shared. Conservation data centers across Canada and the United States are working with iNaturalist to ensure taxonomy is as current as possible and consistent between regions. That way we're all talking the same apples and oranges. Um, in order to use the website, you do need to create an account. Uh, accounts are free though and can be created online. There's no onerous application or promise of firstborn required. Um, and once you've got an account set up, the uh, site gives you the flexibility to configure it very personally. Uh, you can see the profile tab right here. Um, this allows you to set preferences for email notifications, taxonomy updates, photo and audio file sharing licenses, um, as well as the ability to uh, log in from other websites like Facebook, Twitter, Flickr. It also lets you uh, put in a little bio about yourself to let folks know what your interests and skills are. Once you have a, an account, <clears throat> you need a, a camera or I suppose a tape recorder is not the current lingo, but uh, audio recorder uh, or your smartphone. Um, you can upload photos and audio files and identify them yourself if you know what you're seeing. Or you can ask the iNaturalist community to give you a hand identifying something. Once you have sufficient number of users agreeing on the species, uh, it, as I mentioned, it becomes research grade and um, it gets used by other folks. The exact number of confirmations is in a bit of flux right now, but it's not a, it's not a huge number of, of observers. The picture here uh, was taken with my Samsung phone and posted to iNaturalist while I'm in Ontario. You can see the map over here giving a general location of where I was on the uh, east shore of Georgian Bay. I'd never seen one of these moths before, so I took a picture and posted it. Within hours, I knew it was a clear wing moth in the Hemeris genus. And within a day or so, folks had nailed the species. Um, and uh, observation was a research grade and it's really cool looking moth. Um, I think the first time I ever used the website somebody shared a picture of a green cricket with with me and I'd never seen one before so I posted it up and within a couple of hours it had been identified as a Mormon cricket and I was able to get back to um, the individual and let them know what it was and that was about all we knew about the species, so I wasn't able to share much more about it, but now we've got a photo. One of the really interesting aspects of iNaturalist is the, uh, the ability to create projects. Um, here you can see the three projects that I've signed up for. Uh, one of uh, the things that iNaturalist does is sort of block the exact location of sensitive species. Um, and those would be the ones that are federally listed or uh, provincially listed. Um, when you sign up for a project though, each uh, relevant observation becomes part of that project and administrators can see the specific details of, of the, the location and uh, any custom fields that they, they may have included in that particular project. 
So I'm part of the um, Saskatchewan Snake Project that's run by the Royal Saskatchewan Museum. And any of the records that I submit to iNaturalists that are part of, that are snakes, would become part of this project, but um, a Mormon cricket wouldn't. Um, joining joining the uh, the Invasive Saskatchewan project or the Conservation Data Center project will uh, both allow the CDC staff to see your detailed information on, on the observations. Here's a quick summary of the uh, Conservation Data Center project as it sits just the other day. Um, you can see the stats across the bottom. Um, number of species observed, number of observations, number of people that have submitted. Um, and then a little bit on that gamification where you can see who's got the most and some of the most observed species and things like that. Um, really quite a powerful tool and uh, very useful. Um, these projects allow us to um, glean the research grade observations from iNaturalist and incorporate them into the uh, Conservation Data Center's database, um, which we then use to inform decision making that I'll talk about a bit later. For those of you who are familiar with the CDC website, you may have seen the IMAP invasives, <coughs> excuse me, um, invasive species mapping tool. Um, this is again a chapter based tool for uh, reporting on discoveries, observations, control efforts for invasive plants and animals. Um, Jurisdiction uh, becomes a chapter in the in the network and commits a small amount of money and a larger amount of time to representing the, the local interests and in making the product stronger as it moves forward. Um, Saskatchewan is currently the only chapter, but there are a number of state programs that collaborate with us on maintaining and improving the system. IMAP invasives can be used to simply report uh, a sighting of an invasive species. It can also be used to report on surveys, whether you observe the target species or not. And it can also be used to log treatment efforts to control or eradicate populations of invasive species. Um, we just learned this, some, this fall about uh, a flowering rush incursion along the South Saskatchewan River that we're going to have to take a look into. Um, one, of the, one of the really neat functions of IMAP invasives is the ability to set up email warnings um, whenever a report comes in with the spec specifications you've included. Um, you get an email report about that particular Observation. So you can set up um, records for a particular RM. You could set up records for a particular species, um, like leafy spurge, or you could set up a, a list so that you get notification whenever any prohibited weeds are reported. It's a very powerful <clears throat> distributed data entry tool, but it, it's not perfect. Um, but it's very good at reporting and summarizing on invasive species information. As a member of the general public, you, you can just report an invasive on the button right here. Um, you don't need an account and you open up the screen and, and you get a series of fields to fill in. Um, you can attach photos. Um, further down. If you're interested in requesting an account, you can click on the area up here and fill out an application and we'll set you up with a, an account. Um, the uh, public is also able to see a distribution 
of species uh, that are mapped, um, but only by generalized areas. Um, so in this case, we've got the RMs. Um, we're showing the distribution of baby's breath or Gypsophila paniculata by row municipality. Um, so this represents the documented state in, of knowledge in our database. It may not be entirely accurate. I'm willing to make that bet. It depends in large part on, on what folks are reporting. We do work with a large number of the municipal weed inspectors to get information into the system and back out again in a format that is useful to them and to the administrators and councils that they report to. As a registered user, however, you get a much more detailed understanding of the distribution and abundance, as well as efforts to eradicate various species. <clears throat> you can see here uh, grouped observations. As you zoom in, the bubbles break up into precise locational records for, uh, in this case, plants. Um, as users demonstrate a need for more tools, we can scale up with additional functionality from reporting on observations to treatments to creating and leading a specific project in IMAP invasives. All of this is designed to make it easier to enter information at the source and use it in other locations for multiple purposes. Um, in my mind, this is the real power of, of citizen science. It crowdsources the the reporting and inventory work and allows, in this case, qualified pesticide applicators to focus on eradication rather than splitting their time with uh, surveys. IMAP Invasive also has uh, smartphone applications for Android and Apple. They're free to use <clears throat> and extremely handy in the field. I've used mine on the, the Samsung. You can find them or links to them here at the imapinvasives.org website, um, or you can go to the Apple or Google stores and, and search for and download them there. As I said, I don't believe there's any charge for either format. Whether you find the IMAP Invasive site or the iNaturalist site more convenient, if you're part of the Invasive Species Project on iNaturalist, um, we'll be able to get the invasive species reports you submit and integrate them into IMAP invasives. This is sort of our provincial record for invasive species right now. I don't use eBird personally, but um, it's a huge site. Even I'm aware of it. And uh, it's, uh, again, a, a citizen science platform run by the ornithology lab at Cornell University. Um, it's just for birds, surprisingly, and it supports the upload and identification of both images and sounds. It's arguably one of the biggest sites for bird observations and hosts hundreds of thousands of observations, if not more. You do need an account to um, submit your observations, but again, there's no charge. And, and the Cornell Lab is, is tied into ongoing projects like Feeder Watch and Christmas Bird Count, and there's just a huge wealth of information available uh, on the website, aside from the observation data that you can get. Ministry of Environment, excuse me, um, hosts uh, a variety of Excel spreadsheets that we call load forms. Um, each spreadsheet is tailored to a specific type of survey and captures the relevant information, um, who, what, where, when. Um, <clears throat> it's sort of specific to the surveys that you're dealing with. Um, unless you're specifically doing an amphibian survey by call and choose the auditory amphibian survey protocol and load form, 
I would just recommend the species detection load form for any incidental wild species observations that you care to document and submit. These spreadsheets are completed offline uh, and then emailed to the CDC or to the Ministry of Environment, depending on why you were using them. Um, folks who are doing inventory work for profit need uh, a research permit from the ministry and need to send these load forms back to the ministry. If you're just interested in doing this for fun, uh, you don't need a permit and you can use the same forms and send them straight to the Conservation Data Center. Eventually we do get all of the, the forms though. So. And the CDC website is uh, also another avenue for um, submitting information. Um, we have a woodland caribou reporting form online, and this page was built as part of a range planning process to reach out and let stakeholders help us with data collection for this particular species. We also provide access to the Ministry of Environment load forms uh, for folks who are willing to log observations in a spreadsheet format. Some folks like to, to log them in a notebook and then transcribe them back home in the or in the office. A nice roaring fire, glass of scotch, and the time to go over notes and fill out a load form isn't such a bad way to spend some time, but maybe not at the office. Here's the Conservation Data Center submission page. You can see uh, links to the, the load forms in here. Um, the Submit Data button up here um, will get you to this page and to the Caribou page I'll show you in just a second. And email links um, down here for uh, sending in the uh, spreadsheets. Here's the online caribou reporting page. Um, again, names, dates, and there's a Google map right here that will allow you to point and click the, uh, the location. Facebook is another way to, to share data. Um, this, uh, Facebook group here was set up by a, a colleague of mine in the Northwest Territories and uh, <clears throat> folks routinely post spectacular photos or videos of wild species that get them out of bed in the morning. Um, there's a, one fellow up there who has posted dozens of gorgeous photos of slime molds. Um, and you'd be surprised how attractive they are when you don't know what they are. Um, Facebook does support uh, still and video photography, and it will also let you upload um, audio files as well. A couple of the Saskatchewan examples that, that might uh, intrigue you, the Saskatchewan Nature Macro Photographer Group, Saskatchewan Wildlife Photographers Group and the SAS Birders Group. Uh, I'd love to hear about any others. If folks want to send me an email, those are three that I'm familiar with. I'd like to highlight a couple of examples of uh, data sharing projects that are currently underway in Saskatchewan. Um, these two in particular are uh, operated by partners and su supported in part by the ministry and the conservation data center. Um, the first is the breeding bird atlas being organized by Bird Studies Canada. Some of you are probably aware of this breeding bird atlas already um, and some of you may already be participating. Bird Studies Canada is still looking for volunteers to help with the program. Uh, the program includes point counts where transects are driven with standard length stops 
and every bird seen or heard is recorded. The other approach is the general housing approach where you just go out to, a, to an area and spend up to 10 hours walking around looking and listening for birds, again recording everything you see and hear along the way. Uh, once the appropriate number of transects or alicing hours cumulatively have been uh, recorded, you don't need to be out there for 10 hours straight yourself, um, are recorded for a 10 kilometer square, then that area is considered complete and we look to work in other squares. Um, here's the uh, Saskatchewan Breeding Bird Atlas webpage. The Atlas is a, a five-year project uh, to map and understand breeding bird distributions in Saskatchewan. Um, as I said, it's divided into 10 kilometer squares. And the squares are grouped into regions with a regional coordinator. And the goal is to survey as many squares as possible in the five years. Um, year one is in the bag, and we have over 35,000 records uh, submitted so far. They cover 250 species from just under 100 observers. Um, and you can go to sk.birdalice.ca and see all of these stats as well. Excuse me. Um, previous examples in places like Manitoba have been hugely successful, um, providing new understanding of distribution abundance to all sorts of bird species that we don't usually see. Uh, and I would encourage anyone interested in birding to join this effort. In contrast to the Bird Alice, which is a very new project, the Stewards of Saskatchewan uh, has been operating since the inception of Operation Burring Owl in 1987. This is one of the longest running stewardship programs in North America and is also a hugely successful effort. Nature Saskatchewan has been able to secure voluntary agreements to protect habitat for selected species at risk through an ongoing landowner contact approach that is incredibly effective. Um, Nature Saskatchewan has been able to attract and retain members in their programs despite all the issues that have come up around species at risk over the last 30 years. The program has protected thousands of hectares of habitat and has been expanded to include piping plovers, uh, loggerhead shrikes, a suite of grassland songbirds, uh, ferruginous hawks and possibly other raptors, and a large number of rare plant species as well. Volunteers are typically owners or lessees of the land, but Nature Saskatchewan and the Conservation Data Center work together to make sure that any landowner with an owl or any of the other species are made aware of observations and invited to participate. Many choose to do so. If you see any of these species while you're out and about Nature Saskatchewan or the Conservation Data Center, we'd love to hear about them and see if we can add a new member to the program. So I've identified a number of opportunities to share wildlife observation information with a community of interested individuals. The options range from an informal, collegial, or conversational format of iNaturalist and Facebook to more formal submissions on the load forms and, and things like that. I also included a, a couple of projects that are making significant addition to our understanding and protection of wild species in Saskatchewan. The Conservation Data Center draws information from all these sources, but what do we do with it? Well, contrary to what some may think, the data does not go into a black hole. We collect information from eBird, iNaturalist, the Banding Office, other sites, and we collate all of this information into observations. We take time to make sure that the data is complete, accurate, and isn't duplicated already in the database. 
not a huge deal to record observations in multiple locations or report an observation in Facebook and eBird or something like that. But it does add a step in our cleaning and synthesizing, and uh, it takes a bit more time to, to process records that way. Someone once told me data is like a free puppy. While the submission may be free, the care and feeding require effort. Our primary tool for managing this observation information is our observation database. It's currently an ArcGIS database that accepts uh, the load forms uh, quite readily, and we put the other information in there as well. This may change as we work with other CDCs to build a network tool specifically for managing this kind of information, but for now it works. One of the major tasks that we perform at the Conservation Data Center is the assessment or ranking of all species risk of extirpation. This enables the province to focus priorities and management efforts on those of highest risk of extirpation and conservation priority. We use a scale from one to five. Most folks have probably seen our S1 or S5 ranking. S1 would roughly translate into endangered, while S5 is demonstrably secure. Species designated S1 to S3 must be reported on by permitted researchers. We'd actually like to get everything that you see when you're out there. Um, nobody 10 years ago would have guessed that barn swallows would be a listed species. Nature Surf has come up with the, this one to five ranking. Um, they're an international organization with chapters in all the Canadian provinces now. Nunavut was the latest to, to join. Um, they also have programs in all states in the U.S., much of Mexico, and locations scattered throughout South Central America and the Caribbean. Each program is modeled the same way, using the same processes, if not the exact same tool, to rank the risk of extirpation species in their jurisdiction. These initial ranks are typically subnational or S ranks. Um, once those are done, they're rolled up as often as not, go straight to uh, global assessment, skipping the national ranking. Uh, Canada is, I think, an exception, and I'll speak to that in, in just a moment. Um, our ranking process used to be a little too black box for folks. We considered all of the same factors I'll discuss in a moment, but there was more subjectivity or, or expert opinion involved in the ranking, and it, wasn't captured as well as it could have been. Today we use uh, the risk of extirpation modeling along the IUCN approach. We use a spreadsheet calculator available online at natureserve.org to document uh, the following factors. The first being rarity, which would sort of cover the range extent and area of occupancy factors typically considered by Kosiewicz. Specifically, we look at the number of occurrences and the population size, the number of quality occurrences, um, and whether there's any environmental specificity that sort of makes the, the, the species unique. Second factor that we focus on is trends. We look at both short-term and long-term trends in population and in habitat. Populations may stay steady as habitat decreases if the species can concentrate in areas of suitable habitat. Looking at both aspects, we can ensure we assess the status accurately and identify potential problems early. Finally, we look at threats. We consider overall threat imp impacts and any intrinsic vulnerabilities particular to a species. We specifically look at residential and commercial development, agriculture and aquaculture, energy production and mining, transportation and service corridors, human intrusion and disturbance, invasive or other problematic species, pollution, climate change, and severe weather. Each of these factors, we look at the current situation 
and any trends, good or bad, that we may know about them. Botanical Working Group was initiated by the Conservation Data Center to establish a provincial body of botanical experts to advise us on species rankings. They typically meet twice a year and they reassess species based on current information on the distribution and ecology of uh, selected plant species. The approach to ranking animals is a little bit different in that experts are typically identified by the zoologist or they will approach the zoologist about a particular group they're interested in. The zoologist then works with them or a group to uh, come up with assessments typically done by family or genus for vertebrates and invertebrates in Canada. Um, the ranking includes expertise and advice from experts within and outside the province and the purpose is to reassess the status every five years to support conservation management and recovery measures. You can see that the Botany Advisory Working Group has a, a cool tag. There's no three-letter acronym for the final ranking program yet. So, so one of the first uses of those those S ranks um, outside of the, the NatureServe network, I guess, would be the National General Status Program. I'm not sure if folks are familiar with this. It's a federal initiative from Environment Canada, and uh, it expands the S ranking process to the federal or national level. Um, uses the same IUCN approach, um, and rolls that up across the provinces with input from conservation data centers and biologists and experts uh, across the country. Um, this latest report um, covers almost 30,000 species, um, all been assigned subnational S ranks and, and N ranks as well. Reports available on the SARA registry uh, if anyone's interested or you could send me an email and I'll share the link with you. Many of you will be aware of the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, or COSIWIC. This is a group of biologists, ecologists, government employees that make formal recommendations on the status of species. This is the formal trigger for the initiation of a, a Species at Risk Act listing. Um, the minister may, one of three ministers may choose to not list a species. Uh, they've done that for Plains Bison in the past um, for economic uh, reasons. Um, but once, once a recommendation has been made by Kosiewicz, it typically begins a formal and legal process of listing under SARA. Um, most recently in November, um, Kosiewicz has recommended Verna's flower moth be listed as threatened. Species at Risk Act, sort of the final stage in the ranking, the national ranking process. Um, observations that we get in feed uh, recovery strategies, feed action plans. Um, are used in the development of critical habitat. Um, they also contribute to monitoring of recovery. Um, government of Saskatchewan, because this is really bigger than just the Ministry of Environment, commits significant resources to the species at risk file as it's being pushed along by SARA. And at the international level, we work with other programs, NatureServe staff, to come up with those global or G ranks that I talked about. We also do um, element occurrence mapping, which um, is a synthesis of observations, 
habitat and land use data to uh, inform a whole suite of processes from oil and gas well location decisions to crown land sales, things like that. Um, back in the good old days, we were using paper maps and colored stickies to uh, map locations of species. Um, we've come a long ways since then and uh, are using better, stronger GIS tools, um, better satellite imagery and um, GPS technology to, to map things more accurately. Um, you still see some large circles on the maps. Those are representing the locational uncertainty that's been provided to us. We do a number of lists as well. Um, we've got the large eco-regional list um, on our website. Um, and observations are used to inform that listing. Um, also have uh, you see an example right here in, in tabular format. We also create maps and use the observations to uh, come up with range maps of expected and, and known distributions. Um, we typically use the landscape areas and ecoregions. Um, I suppose for some of the aquatic species, we use the uh, watershed maps. One of the last things that, that we, uh, we use observations for is, is something called distribution modeling. Um, this is a more rigorous approach to range mapping or more precisely mapping the habitat that a species is likely to occupy. So we take known locations of species and perform statistics statistical analysis on habitat attributes at the locations where they are. And then we map out the areas in the in the project area that give or take match the known locations. There are a number, number of different modeling techniques. Um, we typically use maximum entropy um, and come up with uh, predicted distribution models for species. There are a number of those um, models on Habisask and uh, folks can take a look at them there. Um, I don't know how well this shows for folks. Um, the first time we used this, I think, in Saskatchewan anyway, um, was mapping Great Plains toad habitat in the Great Sandhills. Um, Andy Didier provided us with about half a dozen locations, or sorry, a dozen locations um, and we ran the, the model and created a map showing habitat that was most similar in the dark green, uh, sort of similar in the light green and dissimilar in the white to the uh, known locations, uh, which are the black dots you might see on the, the map. There's a couple in here. Um, we then sent field crews out that summer and uh, they came back with several hundred additional observations. We were able to confirm the distribution of the species up through this, the uh, Burstall Sandhills, most of the Great Sandhills here, and some of the other Sandhill complexes as well. Um, I would caution folks that um, garbage in, garbage out. Um, models can misrepresent information if critical attributes are missing or observations are skewed, um, but I think we got lucky this one turned out fairly well. So why share? Um, the bottom line, if you're the only person who knows about that observation, uh, it's almost impossible to protect it. Developers come to the Ministry of Environment and the Conservation Data Center because they need access to that information for planning purposes. And the sooner it goes into the planning process, the more likely it is to have an effect. So please share your knowledge with us. If not with 
the government than maybe one of our NGO partners. More damage is done through ignorance than it is through malice. And if we don't know about it, we can't protect it. So on that cautionary note, I'd like to take time again to thank the Conservation Data Center partners for their ongoing support. Without Nature Saskatchewan, NCC, Native Plant Society, and the Saskatchewan Invasive Species Council, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. Uh, I'd like to thank Caitlin and PCAP again for the opportunity to make this presentation and for your patience as I drone on about data sharing. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Jeff. That was a really informative presentation. Um, we do have a couple of questions here. The first one is from a listener named Shirley. Um, regarding the iNaturalist species confirmations, how are the people providing confirmations vetted? For example, are they experts with documented capability in accurately identifying species? Not necessarily. Um, and that is something that we're we're talking with the iNaturalist folks about. Um, certainly don't want to make it uh, for lack of a better term, a you know, boys kind of thing. I want this this whole thing to be inclusive and and useful for partners uh, and observers. So it's a fine line we're walking. Definitely. Um, another listener named Melody would like to know why share information on invasive weeds? Why would a greater operator, for example, enter an observation on an invasive weed? Um, they are uh, next to habitat loss, the second largest threat to um, species at risk, biodiversity. Um, they cost this province alone millions of dollars in lost uh, productivity and um, additional costs in management and control. Um, so they're, I mean, they're a big deal and um, they impact our economy and our environment. Mm. Great, thank you, Jeff. Um, a listener named Krista would like to know which end users of the data have access to the observer's name from the Saskatchewan Conservation Data Center database. Is there a way to submit observations to the SKCDC anonymously? Um, like to say no. Uh, I'd also say that um, we have the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act in this province, which allows us, requires us to not share personal information um, with folks. And so we, we use that to um, not individuals' names, um, unless they're expressly giving us permission to do so. Do you think that you would get more entries if people could submit their data anonymously? I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe they would. Some folks might, might go for that kind of thing. Um, Tough to join the Century Club if that's what motivates you when, when you're not putting your name on something. But um, it's certainly something that we can we could talk about and think about whether whether folks would be more or less likely. Hmm, interesting. Thank you. A listener named Allie here would like to know. Actually, she starts off a ghost from your past. Interesting. <laughs> um, and she's here with a question. What is the connectivity of the eBird app back to the SKCDC? If I observe a bird but didn't or can't get a photo of it, would it still be worth it for her to upload her observation 
to the eBird app or to iNaturalist, or should she still upload it and hope it gets back to SKCDC? Um, I, I think, you know, without a photo, iNaturalist um, won't work for you, Allie. Um, eBird might, and, and what I, I need to check with folks here to see whether we take everything that eBird has for Saskatchewan. We sort of get a, a dump once a year of all the observations from the province. I don't know whether that's screened for things that are confirmed with photos or, or not. So. Okay, that is good to know. Um, Caitlin Burroughs with Nature Saskatchewan um, would like to reply to Krista's question there. And she said that Nature Saskatchewan could submit um, data on someone's behalf if they prefer to remain anonymous. And they can also verify the species in some circumstances. So that's really great information. So if anyone out there is interested in submitting data to the Saskatchewan Conservation Data Centre and would like to remain anonymous, then you could contact Caitlin at Nature Saskatchewan. Thank you very much, Caitlin, for that comment. Um, with that, I think that um, that's all the questions that we have at the moment. Um, if there's any other listeners out there who do have questions, you're welcome to type it in now. Um, I would also like to remind everyone that um, Prairie Conservation Action Plan has a webinar coming up in January about night hawks and night jars. And in February, we have the Native Prairie Restoration Reclamation Workshop that'll be February 7th and 8th, 2018 in Saskatoon. But the early bird deadline is this Friday, December 8th. Um, I'd also like to let all of our listeners know that we have a quick questionnaire after this webinar, so it might pop up afterwards. You might get it as an email. Either way, if you don't mind taking a minute to fill it out, that'll help us keep this Native Prairie Speaker Series in the future. Um, this webinar has also been recorded, so you're welcome to check out <clears throat> our YouTube channel. And for a link of this recording, you can pass it on to anyone who is not able to make it here today. And that link will also be shared on Facebook and social media. With that, I would just like to thank our webinar sponsors again, Environment and Climate Change Canada, Eco-Friendly Sask, SaskTel, and Ranchers Stewardship Alliance, Inc. So it doesn't look like we have any more questions. So thank you very much, Jeff, for the great presentation. And thank you to all of our listeners out there. I hope everyone enjoyed it as much as I did. And have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.